the next part. So in well, in April 2022, um, I um, I I've set up um, a community interest company um, called Nature Connected Neighbourhoods. Before that, we were um, just a, a, a sort of community group. Um, and it's all about creating habitat and corridors for wildlife through wildlife gardening and um, with the sort of nature connection. Um, included um, for the reasons I, I sort of just mentioned, um, and uh, yeah, it's so it's it's very much about uh, sort of helping biodiversity through um, through wildlife gardening, um, and uh, the the reason that came about really was through lockdown. Um, that during lockdown, um, I we were um, sort of much more in the garden. We've kind of really taken it for granted. Um, up to that point and so you know anything we did kind of connected with nature was very much kind of out there in sort of parks and wild spaces um, away from home and um, it, the penny just dropped with me that actually um, this is a place where I probably have most agency and most um, you know ability to um, to actually affect change even though it's a relatively small space um, and um, so we kind of started with a lockdown pond and um what have you my daughter sort of spent all the homeschooling pond dipping and um what have you and um yeah that's that's really um where we we started from and when I saw our first hedgehog on the camera trap there were literally tears of joy we um had heard that they were in decline and um so we hadn't expected to see any any hedgehogs in the garden and it, I'm now alone in our street as the hedgehog lady but there are hedgehog babies and um yeah uh uh there are there are a whole family of hedgehogs that um people here are, are connecting with um so that's um so I wanted to make this quite interactive so if you'd like to in the chat um pop down some of the species you think might need our help in in the London Borough of Richmond or wherever you are I, I tried to make it very local because I assume people were, were very local but um yeah just be very interested to see maybe okay yeah definitely hedgehogs and ladybirds yeah yeah bats hedgehogs frogs toads butterflies yeah yeah Brilliant. okay yeah more hedgehogs yeah not sure if the badgers want anything to do with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're funny enough, we have badgers. Um, I used to live in Sutton and we had badgers in the garden there. Um, our neighbours had this wonderfully wild garden. Um, and yeah, the, so the badgers, I think it was almost wooded. Um, it wasn't a huge garden, but it was big enough that they had almost a woodland. Um, so yeah, badgers definitely uh, will visit. Uh, yeah, bees and butterflies. Excellent. Yeah. So um, you may or may not know um, that, um, well, I think every borough does, but um, we have um, a local um, biodiversity action plan. And on that um, plan, I need to close the chat, um, are um, a number of species, um, not just of animals, but also of, of plants, um, where um, these are um, these fall into lots of different categories um the, for for being on the um on the plan um all of them are in decline um so all of their numbers are are falling um but some of them are there because um they're like the hedgehog they're a great poster child for helping biodiversity so there are species that people can really kind of get around and and do something for and hedgehogs are fantastic as well for explaining why we need wildlife corridors because they cover about three kilometers in a night um foraging for food which having run a five kilometer base with much much longer legs i find amazing um i i yeah the, it's covering that that distance um i i think you're the london marathon runners tomorrow it must be probably even more than that um on on hedgehog legs um but yeah so all of these species have have a reason for 
for being there um you know for, um and they are um very much in decline so we've lost i think something like 69 percent of our wildlife populations on average um since 1970 um and so species like the song thrush and the house sparrow um that were really common when i was a child are now um much less common than they were um they used to be really really super abundant um and um so although they may be recognized as fairly common species um those declines are are concerning i mean uh, not particularly I mean they are a Richmond species but um even sort of herring gull um actually now is because their numbers are so low um they're they're on on the red list um so we've got stag beetle um bats as as a sort of group are on there um the lovely water vole um and and swifts so some of these species um we can directly affect the water vole probably less of a garden species um it's very much a a river one but we're connecting into the river and so the actions that we take in our gardens in terms of um the the things that we're we're doing um you know in, in our sort of um sort of larger wild spaces um can have an impact um and it's also about that sort of mentality so it's about you know just um just ways that we can can help um so is richmond um the greenest borough in London, um, quite possibly. I'm, I've included the sort of much the largest of our, um, our large spaces. I, I heard, but I couldn't find when I was doing the research yesterday, um, the the source for this. Um, but I'm, I know I heard that we were two thirds green space in Richmond, um, which seems incredible. So you, you might wonder, um why we need wildlife gardens. And this actually is something which um, in, in engaging with community comes up a lot, that people think about, um, you know, if we're doing something to help biodiversity, it should be in Richmond Park, Bushy Park, you know, in those spaces that have been kind of um, set aside for nature as, as people kind of see it. Um, but actually I've listed quite a lot of different reasons here um, as to um, why wildlife gardens are important. And the hedgehog is, is a particularly good example um, because hedgehogs actually do pretty well um, from uh, people's gardens under the right conditions. Um, in fact, I think urban hedgehogs are doing much better than rural ones. Um, so you tend to find hedgehogs much more around towns. Um, and so people helping hedgehogs in, in town is, has been has been helping them, um, but they need to be able to get around. So one of the big things about wildlife gardens is that actually this business of creating corridors for wildlife. Um, so we're um, allowing mobility and that mobility is important for, um, for animals, but it's also important for plants, um, particularly as the climate's changing. Um, the plants are moving northwards, so beech trees and, and so on are moving northwards at an incredible rate. Um, and if those seeds don't have soil to land on, and I mean, not necessarily that you would, um, you'd need quite a big space to cope with um, a sort of large beech tree, um, but um, certainly beech hedging and, and things like that. And, you know, perhaps more the sort of smaller species of tree, um, actually allowing that process to happen um is it can be really helpful so um yeah th these these kind of corridors are, are important but obviously i'm not just talking really about um trees here we're talking about all sorts of plants and animals um bees have been doing a lot better in towns um because of the density of um food available for them um so they've been struggling um in in sort of rural areas where there's lots of agricultural land um partly because of pesticides but partly because of these kind of monocultures where there just isn't um food available they need to be feeding sort of i think every 40 minutes um so those those things are um are important i i really take the view um with increasing biodiversity so in, it's we're nature depleted we're actually the most nature depleted nation in europe and one of the most nature depleted um, nations in the world but obviously globally the picture is also um, really um, alarming um, and so we we need to be increasing biodiversity and it needs to you know the, those populations and the habitat has to come from somewhere and so actually starting in a place which is green and and has a much a, a sort of higher level of diversity um, is is a good thing but it's also really good because it's 
it's motivating you're not kind of starting from um uh, you know a, a sort of difficult situation you can there are some sort of quick easy wins you can see your results which which helps um and you're also able to grow social norms so really tapping into you know richmond people love nature people live here because they love the green spaces and you're um you know really kind of building momentum um so so that's important too and what we learn to do through wildlife gardening we can apply to bigger spaces um uh the garden also has some advantages for instance the lack of deer so grazing um can can create some um sometimes issues i mean it, it can be really positive in terms of um sort of shaping landscapes um but um it also means that some species you know that you won't find um in a place that's heavily um grazed by by deer um it could be refuge because there's no dogs um and also uh, unfortunately we are having to think more about things like wildfires and so our gardens have been a place of refuge um for animals when there have been fires um that um particularly you know this is an important reason to have a kind of permeable boundary is that um that that the, if they can get through sort of fence or wall um, they're able to move to to safety more easily um, and the other fantastic thing is that there's an on-site warden stroke ecologist I've called you um, you know so if you're um, you know you're able to monitor what's going on you're able to um, perhaps identify some of the species and see whether there's some help needed you know or you're obviously it can be easier um, to provide sort of watering and really really great place and i think our allotments and um gardens um that there, there are reports um, that have found they are um because of the just the density um in a very small space um they can have more biodiversity than nature reserves um so that was that was quite an interesting study um and then we've got that um we've got trees and plants help to reduce flooding so they're sort of helping to um, mitigate against the effects of climate change they help to reduce the urban heat island effect and um, keeping us cool and by by quite some degrees actually um, and they help to fight climate change obviously we've got carbon capture and storage and soil healthy soil with plants in is a huge part of that what goes on under the ground is is much more actually um probably too two times um what's going on above ground um so um it's it's really really key having um sort of soil with plants in um that's being looked after um yeah the trees and plants help to clean the air um they've been proven to make us happier they um they give out chemicals these phytoncides which um help to protect them from um sort of attack from sort of pests sort of diseases and insects and things um but it turns out that they have a beneficial effect to us they boost our immune system and they sort of naturally help to sort of ward off um diseases so they're really important and um studies have shown that places where they have planted trees along streets um have lower crime rates and that's um that is causal that's not just that you know they just plant trees in in areas where there's less crime um and that actually um has been shown to be um an effect um so we've got another quick quiz um for um yeah if you want to pop into the chat um, it's true or false, England has more ancient oak trees than the rest of the European countries put together. I, I've wanted to find one that, that had Richmond, but I wasn't able to. Um, so, yeah, just see what you think. What we got? Yeah, yes, true. Okay. Yeah, true. Yeah, well, according to the research that I read, it is in fact true. Um, so yes. Um, now have I got? There we go. Um, yeah. So, what are good ideas for a, a wildlife garden? Um, perhaps again, if you'd like to pop any suggestions for what things you think might be kind of good features um, to have in a in a wildlife garden. Let's see. Yeah, be a bug hotels. Yeah, excellent. A pond. Yeah. 
Yeah, fantastic. Piles of leaves are left alone. Yeah. Yeah. This is all good stuff. A loggery. Yeah, lovely. Worms. Yeah, my daughter loves the worms in our garden. Yeah, long grass. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we're going to cover them. Oh, oh. I think, think there are going to be some there. I haven't got on the next slide, actually. Oh yeah, nectar for bees. Yep, brilliant. Okay, so I move to the next slide. Um, so I had six spaces um, because there are many more, but here are, here are some of them. And I think we've got, um, yeah, quite a lot of them. So the loggery, dead stuff, the leaves. Um, uh, yeah, wildlife pond, probably one of the biggest things. If you're going to do one thing, um, having um, a wildlife pond um, is, is probably one of the biggest impact things you can do for biodiversity. Having native wildflowers, so the nectar. Um, but sp specifically, um, the the um, it's, it's kind of thinking in terms of what uh, um, what species the um, the bees do do best with. Um, and and different bees actually do better, or no, not just bees. Um, I should say, um, actually, uh, flies and um, so hoverflies and um, beetles and all sorts of invertebrates um, do uh, do pollinate and are really important. And actually, that whole um, range of species. Um, <laughs> so. Um, yeah so so um yeah there there are plants which suit um the sort of um uh butterflies plants that suit um uh particular um so so long tongued bees for example and there are ones which suit the short tongued bees so it's it's just um there's a wonderful book that Dave Gawson's written um about i think it's called gardening for bumblebees it is called gardening for bumblebees um and that gives some ideas about different different plants um that that can help um hedges are fantastic so in terms of for example helping the song thrush um and this gives them some refuge they provide a linear feature that bats can navigate using um and so um yeah they're, they're obviously a great place for sort of hiding place they tend to be a bit more porous as a boundary if you're using hedges as a um instead of a fence um and we actually have like a dead hedge so um while our live hedges um is establishing our fence blew down in storm Eunice and we've replaced it with um a dead hedge with all the fallen branches so I was foraging the pavements um for months just building up this um this boundary so the dog wasn't running around in the neighbor's garden um but you know this is this is all kind of ideas but it just provides um it, it provides wonderful food um you know so um and and sort of biodiversity in its own right. Um, so the woodpecker frequently comes down to the dead hedge and is uh, sort of finding the insects and things there. Um, but also, um, you know, and, and in a living hedge, it's the same kind of thing. So stag beetles love um, the privet, it seems, um, in, in the garden. Um, and, you know, quite important there, sort of letting it go to flower. Um, so maybe not being quite so tidy. Um, variety is another way of saying biodiversity. Um, so having, yeah, a, a, a sort of variety of habitats, a variety of um, different plant species. Um, and yeah, the long grass. So not just no mow may actually noticing in April um, just the sheer number of um, dandelions and how much um, well, while we were doing the nature connection, we had hoverfly come in and um, sort of other species um, just visiting the dandelion. They do an awful lot of the heavy lifting in this kind of early season. Um, certainly in the garden so um, not mowing the dandelions away is is really helpful so yeah just generally not being too tidy and um, all the kind of um, when when the plants so they can go over to seed so you'll have um, sort of plants for next year but also um, in the stalks invertebrates can overwinter um, so actually having that you've left the, those kind of dead stalks although they may be 
uh, don't fit with a conventional idea of what a formal garden looks like um they're they're really really valuable um and um we need to be thinking more in terms of um whole life cycles so there is a whole um kind of cohort of different animal plant fungi species um that deal with the dead stuff you know that that this is um this is how they survive is that their um you know the worms um all of their um their thing is around um you know decomposing things and this is all your carbon capture and storage they're taking that um the carbon from those um uh sort of you know that dead matter and bring it down into the soil and some of that you know is going into those organisms and um, so it'll be stored as carbon in those um in those organisms some of it's going into the soil some of it will be released back into the atmosphere um but this is you know all of that happening is how um how that sort of carbon capture and storage is is going on um is it's, it's sort of forming new living material um or it's it's being sort of drawn into the soil um so yeah so um what do we want to avoid here we go another another suggestions for the chat if you want to think about things that perhaps we're we're not so keen on um as good wildlife gardens in richmond so. Yeah, we go. Yeah, paving, pesticide, yeah, ornamental plants, yeah. Yeah, changing out plants after they've flowered, yeah. hardscaping yeah and non-native plants yeah lovely um yeah that's brilliant um yeah I didn't include that changing up um plants after the pesticides on on weeds yeah yeah um yeah um so actually uh, disturbing the soil releases carbon back into the atmosphere um so one of the things I didn't really talk about but there's a whole um whole thing around not digging um obviously sometimes you have to um but um and I, the other thing that the digging does obviously it disturbs the root system but it also the um our, our plants are um um kind of connected in um via um what's called a sort of mycelial network so there's these kind of fungi that associate themselves with um with the roots of plants and um then they're able to kind of share sugars and information and things with one another um, there's quite a lot of research around this but obviously if you disturb the soil um a couple of things happen one is that um there are plants that like disturbed soil but there are also plants that really don't like disturbed soil and this probably is associated with all these sort of wonderful things that we're only just starting to learn about going on under the ground um and so um yeah there is maybe one to one to think about um obviously it's not always possible and um some forms of disturbance are really helpful so you'll find in rewilding products they want to have um sort of cattle and things where they're kind of churning up the earth and sort of wild boar and what have you um so that it can be really helpful to have those kind of things going on um but yeah um so i'll move on to the uh if i can there we go um yeah, so we've got, um, yeah, using peat, um, the kind of artificial surface, so plastic grass and paving, um, the pesticides we had, uh, invasive plants. Um, artificial fertiliser. So this is one that might affect our um, water vol. Um, so there are a couple of things to say with that. Most of the, um, so if you wanted to establish a wildflower meadow, um, they don't like fertile soil, which can be make things really tricky um, if you're trying to do that in a garden environment where things can be really, really fertile. And so you, you end up having to kind of go through a whole process. Plant Life on their website have lots about how to um, how to do this, where you're having to kind of mow and um, take off all the cuttings and things um, in order to get the nutrient lowered. Um, so artificial fertiliser, the, the issue with this is it... Um, 
it ends up in the water course. So it, it, it ends up actually all these problems that we're having with our, our rivers. One of the things um, that's uh, part of the problem is it's increasing the level of sort of nitrates and phosphates in the water. And this causes um, lots of algae and things like that. So it can also cause a problem for your garden pond. You'll end up with sort of algae in the pond um, if there's lots of um, sort of high nutrient. Um, and yeah, it, um, it depletes the oxygen in that area which is is one of the things that that causes problems so it's not just for the um uh the species that is this is sort of food that they're feeding on as well um obviously that we're having to, to think about we're having to think about the whole sort of food chain um and um yeah pesticide use um the other one we had a campaign um on light pollution because that's a big issue it's a big issue for moths and um other insects and so it's a big issue for bats um and so it's just kind of thinking around um maybe reducing garden lighting having a think about you know whether security light needs to come on all the time uh, whether it could be directed more towards the ground um those sorts of things so um i put my hands up and i will tell you that i've had i've had plastic grass in my garden in the past I've had paving um when I heard about the insect apocalypse it, it was all being taken up to kind of expose um the uh the soil and you know I've learned over the years so I would not claim to have done any of these things perfectly I've made lots of mistakes and it has to be about you know what what suits your lifestyle and the people around you, what suits the community, you know, and to really give ourselves a break about not doing anything perfectly and not feeling, you know, not kind of beating ourselves up for making mistakes either. Um, so I'll, I'll probably talk about that in a minute. Um, oh, hold on. What's gone on here? It's gone several down. Yeah. So actually that, oops, no, it's still going. Why is that jumping? Hold on. Nope. It's not behaving. It wants me to talk about hoverfly lagoons. Maybe I should talk about hoverfly lagoons. Um, so the um, uh, the University of Sussex has um, a wonderful um, sort of offshoot called Buzz Club. Um, and they do a lot of um, citizen science, particularly around wildlife gardening. So they're kind of looking at things like, you know, how, how to help pollinators um, particularly. And hoverflies are um, particularly wonderful um pollinators and so they have a project around making hoverfly lagoons and um, it's one of the things I was going to be doing today um, but on their website they have details of how to do this which is why there's a milk carton and some sticks and some leaves um, and sort of various options um, and a project uh, which uh, means that you can count and report the larvae if you want to um, which will really help them um, so you just kind of um, count the larvae um, each month um, and um, and watch all these different species emerge but it you know just having that habitat there so this is something you can do on a balcony and and just having that habitat there for them to um, lay their eggs on the dried leaves um, and then the the um, the larvae will uh, eventually um, go through that sort of metamorphosis and, and climb up the the sticks um, to, to get out um to become the sort of adult hoverfly um, but uh, yeah, there's there's lots of lovely resources there, and and it would be really you know this talking about the sort of reciprocity and the nature connection part of it. Um, this is one of the ways um, that you you might like to help both um, our sort of human understanding, but also to help the the hoverflies. Right, let me see if I can get this to behave and go back a few slides. Aha. Okay. So um, yeah, um, going back to what I was saying, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, th these are these are some of the things that I've learned over the years that basically, you know, I'm going to make mistakes. Um, I spent the the time um, sort of learning from nature. So from that very first kind of um, probably even before lockdown, but um, really from lockdown um, when we first moved here, um, I I took a year or two just to sort of learn what was here what the garden was doing um and and then in more recent times sort of learning from nature about you know how to um garden for wildlife so I'm not fully put my hands up I'm not a horticulturalist I'm not even a very good gardener everything that I've learned really has been coming from 
nature and obviously a certain amount from sort of scientific studies and, and things like that. Um, and and I think as um, we're facing these really dynamic times with sort of climate change and things, actually understanding how trees behave when they're stressed and, um, you know, what happens if you allow a natural regeneration um, and, and sort of, you know, just what wants to be here um, in a changing climate. Um, this is really important. Um, and, you know, I don't think that science can keep pace um, with the changes. So we're always going to be learning things kind of at the back end. Um, so it's, I think, really um, good to be sort of tuned into what's going on and just noticing. And, and at the same time, as a scientist, I would say, being very aware that what you see anecdotally, um, so what happens one year is not necessarily a pattern. Um, it's It might just be something that's happened that particular year. Um, and so, you know, holding it very lightly. Um, but I, I kind of take the attitude of being kind of, you know, putting nature in the driving seat and then, you know, just tweaking around the edges um, because these natural systems sort of, you know, generally know best. There are things, particularly where you're sort of undoing kind of human mistakes um, where there's maybe a fair amount of intervention needed. Um, and, and it's always a balance between, you know, um, so my garden is probably particularly wild um, and not everybody's cup of tea um, because I've, I've kind of gone through a kind of bit of a rewilding experiment just to see how a garden, you know, would rewild and that was one of the other things is as uh, that I learned that gardens don't exactly rewild you know they um the, this land that um I'm on now um used to be part of Hounslow Heath um and uh the chances that it would ever go back to heathland is you know especially with no grazing um it, it is pretty much impossible I mean if there was grazing going on and um uh, sort of you know that those nutrients being brought down then then possibly um but obviously it is a garden and that's that's not going to happen um and uh so it's kind of seeing you know what species are, are sort of do well from it being a garden um you know and what is a garden so there, there are sort of questions around that to sort of explore with you know both our human community as well as our, our sort of wild community um, related into that thing of saying about, you know, what you observe in one season is not necessarily a pattern or a trend. It might just be, you know, the, the kind of this one season. Um, it can be quite frightening. You know, species one year may completely disappear, but they'll come back the next. Um, and but you'll end up with maybe different species um, in, you know, in that other year. And so it's, it's and it's also... Um, you know, when you're, you're first kind of starting, actually, the thing that I found really difficult was thinking, you know, what have I done? I've turned this from a garden into this kind of wild space and, you know, everybody's going to judge me and um, et cetera. Um, but then when everything's in bloom in the summer and, you know, it, it looks amazing um, and, you know, I'm, but there is this kind of constant thing of, um, you know, this kind of constant tension of kind of breaking new ground and, um, it's sort of not looking like um, the sort of old idea of kind of formal gardens. Um, so all these photos here are actually photos um, from the garden here. Um, so we've got the sort of water mint and um, and the ragwort and, and what have you. Again, we're not on anywhere near agricultural land, but I think even if we were, ragwort tends to only be a problem. So I know the new forest very well. And there is lots of ragwort there, grazing ponies and cattle. They won't eat it. Um, except by mistake if it's kind of cut up in hay. Um, so, um, you know, they know not to eat the ragwort. Um, and, and so it, it tends to be that it's only a problem if you're actually near somewhere where there's going to be grass cut for the hay or, or sort of things going into, um, uh, you know, animal feed. Um, and, um, yeah, so things change year on year. Um, grass is very dominant in a garden, um, if it's a garden with a lawn, um, but it's also home to species like grasshoppers and crickets and, and all sorts of invertebrates. Um, and, you know, it, in itself, I think it's probably underrated um, as, a, as a form of, um, you know, that, that sort of carbon capture and storage picture. Um, so our, our grasslands actually are, are, are quite important. Um, and uh yes what else oh so um the other great thing about not mowing is you get some time and to connect and watch the wildlife and enjoy what you've made possible by not 
actually doing anything. And I mean, that's just been wonderful. And quite honestly, was about the only way I kept my sanity um, during lockdown. Um, it, you know, it, it really um, made huge difference. Um, and the other big lesson I learned was don't think that biodiversity is everything and get kind of one of everything. Um, trying to pack in as many different plants as you can because there's this sort of balance between having um, enough of a population to support a population of animals and, and remembering as well that your garden space hopefully is not in isolation it will have those you know Bushy Park, Richmond Park etc but also hopefully other people's gardens and so you know you might only have um, a very tiny um, patch of um, you know dandelions or something um but your neighbors will have some too and so that's you know all of that together is is creating a population that can support you know all the bees or and um, whatever else so but but yeah um if you were sort of getting um particularly sort of butterfly species um like with the ragwort with the cinnabar moth and um, so moth species um that's that's kind of a favorite food plant of their caterpillar um, you know, if if you were um, thinking, I'll get something because I know that, you know, this this particular species is in trouble and I know that they like this, um, you probably want to have a fair amount of it. Um, so, uh, right, try the next slide. Oops, here we go. It's off again. Uh, so, yes, so these are just a few photos. Um, the um, The picture on the right is the first year. Um, during lockdown so we did plant um sow some annual seeds and that really helped actually because um it just gave um some uh some nice things to see uh while while all those kind of biennials and the perennials were were settling in um so that we had something completely different um the next year but it it can be helpful for some people not too keen on having the sort of annual seeds in mixes um but you know, in terms of um, kind of getting people on board with what you're doing, um, they they were really helpful. And, and in terms of kind of just giving me a little bit of reassurance, there's a great spotted woodpecker in that picture as well. Um, but yeah, so these are, you know, we've had frogs and frog spawn. Um, we've now got three ponds, um, one in the front garden um, and then a, a couple, a very, a very small one. The first one was kind of sort of dog bowl size, but that was enough um, for uh, the, um, uh, for the, uh, frogs to lay their spawn in um, and um, yeah I'll, I'll come on in a minute to sort of some of the things you can do in a smaller space so yeah please don't think that you have to have a huge garden by any means um, to be helpful because that a lot of this is is um, about what you're connecting to and just providing um, all those opportunities and inspiring other people to do the same um, oops so that's yeah just yes yeah, so that's a very early stage the juvenile robin in the bottom left um the pond this is the kind of nomo in the top left um various the frog spawn and things the uh, hedgehog on the camera trap and fox drinking from the the pond um uh yeah the sort of bees on the uh, green alconet and things some um the red damselfly and and so on so yeah just lots of different um lots of different interest um it's been yeah that's that's the best bit about doing this um you know it's not just that you're doing a kind of greater good but you get to enjoy it as well um so for smaller spaces um we have a couple of these ideas um sort of using was kind of reclaimed material so washing up bowl um to make either a, a pond or a bog and so this is ideal not just if you've only got a sort of balcony or a very small patio, um, but also um, with, with children, um, you know, with very small children, you might be worried about having a water feature. And so this is a way to have a water feature. Um, and I know people who've had um, newts. Um, the, the key thing is to make sure that there's a way um, with all these ponds and, and things for them to get in and out um, safely. So you you particularly if with a pond um, and especially a deeper pond, it needs to have kind of a shallow gradient um, and or um, some kind of ramp um, so that if hedgehogs and things get into the pond, they can swim, but if they can't get out, they will drown. Um, so that's that's really um, important. Um, you can have sort of window boxes or kind of a pot meadow. We've got lots of those. We find actually lots of the wildflower seeds, even though they're in compost, um, seem to do better um, in the pots than sort of competing with the grass. So it can be a really good way of kind of getting things established. And then you could, you know, sort of plant them on. 
um, or in a small space, just have them. Um, yeah, so the planters and things are, are really good. Um, I put green walls and roofs there. I will mention we went to apply for a grant um, uh, from, um, oh, what was the GLA? Um, the London Assembly and they um, they were very clear that they wouldn't fund green walls and roofs in this because they were concerned about fire risk so although I've put it there um, I don't know about the fire risk that they're concerned about but I thought I'd mention that because in case it's a um, an issue but obviously just thinking as well I mean even with a, a bigger garden thinking in terms of layers and kind of going vertically um, that you know not just having things kind of at ground level um, but but really think about having things going on, um, yeah, sort of vertically. Um, ivy and climbers are are absolutely fantastic. Ivy particularly um, obviously provides cover for birds and things like that. Um, but it also um, it provides food um, it, more towards those colder winter months. Um, and so there's a I mean there's a particular bee, this um, sort of ivy bee that uh, that feeds on ivy. Um, so it's it's a really really important and and underrated species, and obviously it gives you lots of lovely green colour at a time when there might not be sort of much else going on. Um, yeah, bird feeders and nest boxes, so swift boxes and swift tiles and things can be really really helpful. And then if you don't have access, and this is something I'm really passionate about, is is kind of um, you know allotments and community gardens and shared spaces. And we are hoping at some point in the future um, to see whether we can get people teamed up, people that are having problems looking after their garden because they may be having mobility issues with people that don't have access. Um, and so, um, everybody should have access to some green space. Um, right, it's off again. Uh, so just a few um, suggestions of of plants. I mentioned ivy. Herbs are brilliant. Um, and obviously you get the benefit of being able to use those in, in cooking. Fruit trees, again, um, edible, but um, we have a cherry blossom on at the moment that's absolutely covered in bees. Um, so those those fruit trees, um, yeah, are really wonderful. And obviously, um, as as painful as it might be as a gardener, um, you know, sharing that fruit with the animals. We had a green woodpecker that was feeding on the um, the fallen apples. And uh, I mean, th this woodpecker was absolutely huge. Uh, so they must have been... Um, uh, yeah doing quite a good number on the um on the fallen apples it took us a while to work out what the uh, the kind of um stripes were what, what had been eating these apples um yeah things like native hedging and flowers for wildlife and so on um that's the hoverfly lagoons and yeah so i'm going to stop sharing there um that yeah if there's anything you wanted to ask or comment or or anything please feel free i'm just going to go to the chat oh thank you I think you've answered the question I was going to ask Claire, which was like, so if you wanted a pond, like how small could it be? But if you're suggesting that I could build something in a as small as a wash basin, then even my little tiny garden might be might be usable. Am I likely to get any frogs in a in a tiny basin? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Do you know I was sat meditating in the garden one evening. This is it really is good getting out in the in the garden in, in the evening. And there was a sudden splosh. And it just, I mean, it wasn't meant as a pond. We just had this, um, I, I think it was a washing up bowl with some water in. And this frog had jumped into this wash. It, it, you know, even if they're not um, necessarily living there, they will lay their spawn there. And um, they will, um, yeah, they will use it as a, as a stopping off point. So this really comes back to the power of gardens, you know, that they, they do need to move. They need to be finding new areas to breed and things like that. And if they've got somewhere, you know, a pond spaces, um, you know, you can have a high binacular so they can, there's somebody uh, somewhere where they can take refuge. Um, all of those sorts of things really, really help. Um, and, and it means that, you know, as their population grows, they're able to move to other areas so that the gene pool is diverse so they're not kind of breeding within their own um sort of generation so yeah um yeah no absolutely I what I'll do I will make a note um I I, I think we've got on our website the um details of the I'll, I'll double check I'll make sure I've got details of how to do the um what I call the bog bowl which is the bog garden in a washing up bowl and the pond bowl um that we can can share afterwards great yeah and i put the buzz club um 
website up in the chat, but I can also follow it up to people if they want to get in touch. Um, yeah. That's in fact, what brilliant. I'll probably do is compile any resources that would be useful and pop them on the social channels, so on the Facebook um, and the like, so that everybody can access it and um, even people who haven't come today can get to it later. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. I don't know if anybody else uh, wants to ask a question. I don't think I've forcibly muted anyone. If I have and you want to say something, uh, pop it in the chat and I'll unmute you. <laughs> Welcome to uh, some new people who joined in the middle of the wildlife chat. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm trying to think if I have any more questions. I mean, other people in queue might have struggled. I, my main garden struggle is rats, to be fair. Um, and try not to, you know, make them villains or put out things to, to catch them or hurt them. But um, it does kind of limit things that I can do back there. Like I can't put out any bird seed or any anything that they recognize as food, pet balls and that kind of thing because uh, you know they will climb a tree and get to whatever they want to get to. So that's a bit of a challenge yeah. and it's a shame because we have uh, lovely birds that we'd like to feed, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is, um, that is definitely an issue. I, I kind of take a don't help, don't harm, which I think sounds very much like that what you were saying um, is, is don't help, don't harm. But obviously there is the risk that, you know, a neighbor might put down poison if there's a large population so it's always a bit there is a bit of a tension there um I think yeah they're not quite the bad guys that they're made out to be the sort of diseases that tend to worry about sort of virus disease and so on um are very rare um and and obviously there are things that you can do like covering cuts and things like that to to stop yourself from being exposed and you know if you're um, sort of using garden gloves and um being careful in ponds and things um is is all um sort of ways that we can live alongside them without being too much of a problem um yeah bird feeders are a bit of a funny one and it's there's a bit of a balance there's so it's really important to say that you know bird feeders need to be kept really clean and moved once a month so that they're not um uh, and especially I mean it's less affecting garden birds the avian flu um but there are diseases that affect so we've really lost um around here particularly um green finches and chaffinches there are green finches but I don't think I've seen a chaffinch here or heard a chaffinch here um in the entire time that I've lived here there's a disease called trichomonosis and I think there's another one as well which is a really horrible disease and unfortunately it seems that one of the big problems is around bird feeders that they're they're picking it up um and uh, so the same thing goes with um bird baths um, there is something really, really useful that you can do as part of this kind of wildlife corridor and everything and, and sort of, you know, gardens as, as refuges is to provide water and, and to provide very shallow water with stones and things for the species that don't like to be in water, but, you know, like all of us need to drink water. Um, but um, those need to be kept clean again because that can be another place where those diseases can spread. Um, it seems that the pond ecosystem, the science is suggesting that actually um, in a pond, because you've got all these other kind of microorganisms and tiny things all doing that, that whole life cycle thing I was talking about, about sort of leaving the dead stuff and what have you. Um, it seems that that helps to stop these diseases. So in that situation, you've got sort of nature taking care of the problem, but these sort of artificial human um sort of sources of food and water um we have to unfortunately we do have to sort of do some maintenance and clean them and whatnot um yeah it, it's sort of sad otherwise we're kind of unintentionally hurting um yeah yeah i i've never heard i've never like been told to move the feeders around either so that's interesting advice yeah shall I, I put that the rspb do have a lovely thing on their um, website they provide also sprays so you know that the spray that you're using is is harmless um to the birds so they'll do sprays and brushes and things that you can get and hedgehog food i didn't mention lots of people love my neighbors love feeding hedgehogs um but there are some horrors um you know so bread and milk and things are, are a definite no no their cat food's good um and um yeah not too many uh so mealworms probably best avoided because those can be problematic um but the rspb again do 
specifically hedgehog food so you know that what you're feeding is is safe um but yeah so I'd, i i will put that on my list um because the rspb do have a thing on their website um which talks about how to take care of bird feeders and one of those things is is just to move it around mm -hmm. um yeah i so the the other thing to mention um which kind of plays into thinking about um whether to have a bird feeder or not um is that some bird species do really well from bird feeders so great spotted woodpeckers do fantastically well but they're I, i'll say this quietly so they you know but um they can be a bit of a bully um and so um they're sort of lesser spot woodpeckers that um the less spotted woodpeckers um are not doing so well partly because they need to trees which we have a horrible tendency to clear up because of you know health and safety and things um the, where yeah they they ought to be left if it's if it's at all possible um but they don't do very well from bird feeders because they are easily bullied and so there's this conflict but same thing with the um with the tits the blue tit and the great tit very good at sort of you know defending their territory standing their ground and what have you and so um the marsh tit and willow tits um suffer because um the, the you know the population of marsh uh, great tits and blue tits is bigger and um you know particularly in the woodland areas where they um tend to nest they they get um sort of pushed out and so um it's it, it's a bit of a balance with bird feeders as to you know just um in fact we're such a nation of animal lovers and with our bird feeders, I mean, we spent, uh, I can't remember how much it was, um, but the, I think it's the black cap now has a subspecies. Um, it, it, they've adapted, so their bills have changed to be able to use our bird feeders. Um, and and they are, um, this is, uh, it seems to be specifically a UK thing. Um, but yeah, so um, obviously it's, it's, you know, a great way that, um animals can adapt um to, to survive um but not all animals are able to do that and some will sort of lose out and so it's yeah it's just kind of um being mindful of it um yeah I, but th i think that that just reminded me of another thing to say which is that you know although um the insect declines and things are really really concerning and obviously they're at the bottom of a lot of the or not at the bottom but you know lots of the birds and things um depend on these in their food chain um, so, you know, when you're thinking about the swifts and things and helping swifts, actually, if you're helping the insects, you're helping swifts. So with a pond, with, you know, even if you've got mosquitoes, you're, you know, so it's really in the garden thinking in terms of whole ecosystems. And the really good news with helping insects is that you will see results very quickly because their life cycles are very short. And so, you know, we we can actually we could turn this insect apocalypse around really quickly just by stopping doing some of the really harmful things we're doing you know the pesticides and so on and um yeah so uh, you know that it's really possible to have an, an, an on an individual garden level you can see species coming in just because you've you know made some changes um it, and and yeah i mean sort of frogs and newts and things it, it seems like it's overnight you think where did they come from mm -hmm. um but yeah yeah I don't know if anybody else, we've got a few minutes left. I don't know if anybody else wants to raise a question. I mean, I was just going to say maybe for the sake of um, everybody doing, being able to do, take one thing away, like Claire, what, what would be the one thing maybe we could recommend people do in their garden, whether it's big or small to like start helping particularly the insects. And as you said, that would feed right up the chain. So most insects have um, an aquatic, or no, not most insects, many insects have an aquatic phase in their life cycle. So really it is that um, having a pond uh, or some, some kind of water feature um, is is probably, um, yeah, way up there in terms of sort of big impact things. Um, obviously that's not necessarily accessible to everybody. Um, and so um, I, it's, it's, the, probably the biggest thing that we can do is to model actually messier gardens and not being so tidy and and you know having things a little bit wilder so not necessarily you know messy in the but but less tidying up and and just really starting to kind of um shift mindsets into you know a wild meadow can look beautiful having or but even if it's just a um a flower pot with what people might think of as weeds 
but with you know the sort of native flowers um and yeah that that is powerful and and just talking to people about what you're doing so having those signs that say you know pardon the weeds we're feeding the bees um again it's you know it's all those kind of ripple effects so even if you have only a very small space you know you might be affecting someone who has a lot bigger space yeah so it's resisting that temptation to make everything look lovely all the time and letting things move at their own pace I guess yeah yeah uh, yeah uh, yeah it's just it's just that kind of gentle sort of shift um because as much as it seems like the sort of plastic grass and things is infectious it goes the other way as well that's a good positive message